Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. And I know some of you drove a distance to get here, and so a special thank you and to my friend Wendy, who even flew in from Rhode Island. So I really appreciate the, your attention today. Um, and thank you, Caleb, for curating a beautiful show for me and to the Tyler Museum and the staff for being so gracious and easy to work with. I really have enjoyed it. And it's just such a pleasure to see 40 years of work up together, even though this is not a complete retrospective of all the different phases of, of work that I've been through, um, it, it does give me a, a, an opportunity to, to reflect on what has been consistent um, through 50 years of painting, and that's a real privilege. Um, and so I'm going to sort of talk about the things that are consistent and how, and how I got there and why they're there. And Caleb very generously um, gave me input on the show and together we sort of agreed on a thematic umbrella, uh, that being my position as an artist, as an observer. And I think that uh, hand in hand with that, could, it could be my position as an artist, as an observer, and a storyteller, because I think they, they've intertwined uh, throughout all my painting. Um, and so well, let's get started. Let's see, I need a little button here. Got it. Okay. So um, <laughs> I had the luck of being a leave it to beaver child. I had grandparents in New Mexico, and because I got to spend summers with them in the wilderness with wild animals, I developed a deep love for nature and appreciation for all the things that existed in it. I also had grandparents in Central Texas on a farm. That's me on my horse, Bill. No relation to my husband, Bill. <laughs> and, um, you know, spent many afternoons without TV, without social media, <laughs> in the grass, watching grasshoppers, ants, on a pier, watching fish in the water. It was a, it was a very lovely intertwining with nature, and I've never lost that fascination through my whole life. And as I began painting, uh, of course, I wanted to paint what I knew. And we live out of Austin. Well, actually, Austin has grown to us, a little bit west of Austin. And so um, as a young painter, I just began painting what I knew, the animals around me, uh, whether they be on our property out of Austin or pets or domesticated animals. Um, I've just always been fascinated with their environments, with their unique inhabita inhabitations and, and how, and their interactions. Here we go. And so hand in hand with being an observer, as I said, is being a storyteller. And that runs deep in my family lore. I do believe in the power of myth and storytelling to evoke strong emotion and also to touch on our universal experiences. This is a, a, a phase of painting that I went through with a lot of spirit figures and human figuration that I'm not really going to go into much in the talk, but it does fit under the umbrella of storytelling. That's the constellation Cygnus, swan chasing the owl there. I work in watercolor and gouache and oil and do prints and also have some clay pieces out in the foyer there. This is not Melissa Miller, I wish. This is William de Kooning. So as long as we're talking about things that are consistent, I'll talk about the fact that I have always been in love with materials. And I, my formative education was sort of at the end of the height of the ABEX movement, Abstract Expressionist Movement where the, the paint stroke uh, could be considered both form and content. 
and I did fall in love with the medium of paint. And when I was a student at the Yale Summer Student Program, uh, Philip Guston came to be a visiting artist and opened up the possibility of combining the love of the stroke and the material with figuration. So this is just a detail from the painting behind the screen here. I hope after the, sh after the talk you'll go back and look at it. Uh, to show you that, that you know, I have, I have maintained my love of the aggressive brush stroke. Um, and I also have been very influenced by Japanese art, Asian art in general. But in, in Japanese screens and scrolls, they are chock-a-block with animals, which drew me into them. And the respect they had for, the, for, for their, you know, unique existence um, sometimes are, are possibly based on the Buddhist belief in the sort of a reverence for all living things. So there's an example of a little gouache of me, uh, of the Asian influences on my art and a more delicate kind of approach. As long as we're on influences. <laughs> I'm a child of the 50s, and uh, my pop culture at that time, I saw animals that had um, a lot of human attributes like loyalty and courage and um, even moral compass. And so we have Lassie on the left and, and Old Yeller on the right the movie my mother had to take me out of screaming when they were going to shoot O'Yell. <laughs> and of course Disney where you know animals talked and and solved problems and overcame adversity. Also at that time my heroes were found in westerns and this is Annie Oakley, whom I was in love with, and that's the real Annie Oakley on the left, and that's the beautiful Gail Davis on the right, playing Annie Oakley. And I think that from that I learned that women could be strong and independent and, you know, make their own path. These are the Miller children living, living their myth of the West, and it looks, I'm, I'm on the right there. I think I'm the only one my parents didn't even trust with a toy gun. <laughs> I also was taken to the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston, which is uh, the home for wonderful Russells and Remingtons, the paintings. And what I got from that was this beautiful, you know, introduction to sort of nature in a very raw and visceral form. Um, and, and the close relationship between humans and, and their animals uh, depicted in paintings of the Old West. That's a Russell. This is a Remington. It's always one of my favorite ones at the Museum of Fine Arts. So when I began sort of branching out on finding what my path would be as a painter, you know, the old adage of write what you know or, or whatever. I, I painted what I knew, which was me lying across a pier, looking at the animals in the water, looking at the fish in the water. Um, my early paintings contained human figuration, but as you can see, it didn't capture my imagination the way that the things around me did. The, the dramas that were happening that, that circumferenced our human interactions. And also, you know, animals and birds, fish, they were also just so much more interesting to paint. They had color and they had shape and they had feathers and scales and it was just so much more interesting to me. So you can see that even in my early paintings the, the animals came to the forefront. They, they, were the, they were the subject matter and so at some point I just made a decision to drop the human figuration. And uh, so as a storyteller, the, my earliest animal paintings were a lot of time allegories for human, 
human interactions and dil dilemmas and dramas. Uh, animals were a stand-in for human figurations. So what I, what I have chosen to show you on slides are some examples of the themes that I worked through for a while. And so one of the themes uh, was uh, temptation and disguise. This is a painting of the fable of Aesop's crow, where the crow dons all the feathers of the other birds to present himself for a contest to be king of the birds, but he is he's stripped of his costume by other birds who do not like his deception. Another painting of, of costuming and, and deception. The wolf dancing as a deer. I also had um, themes where, uh, where weather played a huge part, it, it, sort of an illusion of control we have sort of this a, a, pending, a pending drama out there uh, that we cannot control. This is the painting right here on the, on the left, on the right, you're right. Paintings about ritual. Resistance. Uh, folly and play. This is about as animated as I ever got. <laughs> Anthropomorphic is a better word. Um, this is a painting, this is a, actually a serigraph um, based on a painting, and the themes that I was exploring were fears that we, fears of our own creation. So this is a leopard, a panther here, sort of fighting these images of his, his, his own imagination and psyche. And paintings about grief. And paintings just about wonder. Um, here's a monkey sort of making a stork shadow here. And just what I observe animals doing often, which is just sort of being involved in their own delight. Doing what they do. Curiosity. I love the stillness of this painting. And survival. Predator and prey has been a huge theme for me, as you can see through the show. Um, and you know, again, with with storytelling and observation going hand in hand, along with an interest in how to manipulate paint, how to get it to represent certain things or, or have its own kind of song, uh, you know, even though all these intentions are brought into one sphere, um, they still have metaphors. So they, they may be observations from what I read or what I see, uh, but there's also, you know, the metaphor of, of allegory of, you know, struggle, str fish struggling up a, a cliff there, a scene to spawn and finding bears at the top too. More predator and prey. Zebras don't seem to fare very well in my work. <laughs> <laughs> There's another painting here of a little zebra kind of getting it back there, yeah. I don't know. I don't have anything against zebras. <laughs> and weather becomes a character in itself. And we are experiencing it, aren't we? Floods, fire, 
Again, that's the painting behind the screen here. We, uh, my husband and I own a small cabin in New Mexico, and we were in the epicenter of that huge fire last summer. I had painted this earlier, um, and you know, hoping it wasn't prophetic. I painted a very large painting back in the 80s in which I tried to tie a lot of my themes together. Uh, and I used the story of, the, of Noah's Ark as sort of a format and an excuse to bring all these animals and themes together. So I think, Caleb, you said I have a little red thing on here. Is this the top one? Uh, yes. So there, again, themes of temptation and observation and predator and prey in here somewhere, the weather coming in, being a character in itself, um, talking about interrelationships, um, just, you know, trying to trying to create my own master's thesis, really, bring it, bring it all to, to some kind of summation. This painting is at the Fort Worth Modern. If you're there, they, they usually keep it up, which is very lovely. That kind of brings us to the Anthropocene, our current geological epoch which many people would argue that we are already in, where humans now are the main cause of changes on the planet, the big changes on the planet. And this is a painting I did back in the early 90s about pollution in the sky. And this painting is not in this show yet, but this is, um, you know, you read about the islands in the ocean now made of nets from all the fishing boats that have cut loose their nets and all the trash that goes into the ocean, and they form these huge, you know, islands which become environments by themselves, uh, but they are also you know, very threatening to the life in the ocean. This painting is in the show. Um, you know, it's, what we see is a very subtle changes sometime. I mean, you don't drive along the highway and not see what I have reported here. Uh, these are wild grapes with tulip magnolias, but you, you know, I don't even need to, to make slides of, of all the detritus in the trees and by the side of the road. What I do enjoy doing in these large paintings is throwing in a lot of subtle clues. I mean, this is a very Texas painting for me with, um, all sorts of little clues in here as to subtle ways the environments are changing. I've lived on the same property for 48 years, and I've seen whole species of birds pass through and never come back again. When I first moved out there, there were painted buntings and scrub jays and wild turkeys, and now I see dove and a lot of cardinals, which are a delight. Uh, and crows. It's, it's the, whole, the whole bird environment has changed out there. So I think what happens is that there are just what I call kind of a creeping, a creeping environmental change, which I think I try to insert into my paintings. I think in here somewhere is a little, is a little parrot or parakeet. Um, there's a whole colony of, of small parrots now that live in Austin that 
find the climate very lovely for them and, and have built whole colonies, but they were, they were initially pets. I like playing with space. Um, and this, this is an example of sort of a stacked space that I adopt from Eastern art, again, from Chinese scrolls and, and um, small Indian miniatures, where scale doesn't change that much, but it moves you through um, a hierarchy of distance there. Again, an example of sort of creeping change where we have um, removed apex predators. And so what I see around where I live now is a ton of rabbits because <laughs> the coyotes have moved. They've, they've moved off. So habitat change and and destruction has been forefront of my mind for many years. When we sold the family farm in Central Texas, I went around and took photographs of adjacent property. And what it illustrated to me were, were the slow changes that were happening in animal husbandry and in the import of exotics and things to the Central Texas landscape. There was a sort of an emu pyramid scheme, remember when they were gonna be the next white meat? And <laughs> so there are a lot of geriatric emus kind of wandering around out there. <laughs> and, then, and then a lot of, of the ranchers and farmers uh, invested in llamas and uh, what I was told is that they were very good substitutes for guard dogs, that they really were very protective of, of cattle and, and other livestock. So there are a lot of llamas wandering around, and then a lot of exotics. I may have exaggerated a bit with these slightly blue goats, but um, I do see, and I think I have a slide of it, yes, uh, in Bernie, Texas, uh, I saw this giraffe. And whether we're importing them for novelty or for hunting or for conservation, uh, you, you do see, especially in Texas, these, you know, the high fences is a big clue with, with barbed wire or other obstruction. And you know that there's something in there that they don't want out and you, you do find a lot of interesting animals in Texas pastures now. So another example of sort of this creeping change are, and, 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 and how humans are, are reconstructing um, habitats and animal environments. This is cattle and, and elephants trying to forge something from trash heaps in Sri Lanka. This is my imagination of something happening in the Middle East because I, I do read, I don't travel a lot, but I read avidly about um, animals and their welfare. Uh, and this little bear here is not an exaggerated scale. He is actually a little sloth bear, which are captured for entertainment, um, so, I, so I read. Uh, this is my newest painting about the border wall here, the Texas border wall we've built, and the, just using it as an example of our human decisions and how they affect migration and how they affect habitat. Uh, it, it will affect um, endangered species like these Texas ocelots and panthers. It probably won't affect 
you know, our, our wild boar. <laughs> They'll be around anyway. But it is also affecting the, the, the gray wolf. I put a little evidence of human interaction up here. We've all read about our melting icebergs and how that will affect habitat, hunting, survival. This is a small um, woodblock print that I did with Flatbed Press. And Catherine Brimberry is coming next week, that I think, to talk about some of the prints in the exhibit. And she's a wonderful woman and speaker, and I'm sure will branch off from my subject matter into how prints are made in general, and it'll be very interesting. So my hope is that by, by merging observation and narration, I can give the viewer a very rich experience. You know, I know my observation is shaped by my cultural influences and prejudices. And, but as a storyteller, what I really hope to provide is what they call in haiku and in poems a kind of a hinge moment where a word or a phrase or, or an image goes from a specific, something narrow and specific and, and, a, and allows an opportunity for some kind of expansive perception. And, and that's really the crux of, of my hope behind what I do. And, um, I'm just hoping maybe we can all become a little more conscious of where our styrofoam cups end up. Right, right here. So, so thank you. Oh, I want to say one more thing. Oh, and then we'll open it up for questions. Okay, sounds good. I just wanted to thank the Tyler Museum, Ron Gleason, one, one of the wonderful directors here in the past, and the small museums in Texas for being so supportive of Texas artists. Uh, the big museums are bringing in shows nationally and internationally, and they're wonderful to see. But it's the work that you all do here and so many little art centers around Texas that, that promote our work and, and support us. And for that, we're very grateful. So. Thank you both, and thank you for supporting your museum. Okay. Now I'm happy to take questions if there are any. Yes, would anyone like to ask any questions? Uh, would you talk a little bit more about uh, the forest fire painting and uh, its, its genesis? And, and uh, uh, sure. I specifically, if, if it was inspired by any of the forest fires in Texas? Yes, you know. Um, Given my history in New Mexico, especially, um, forest fires, ever since I was a child, are a threat. My, my grandparents lived way up in the National Forest. And um, I remember evacuations as a small t child, and they've always been, you know, in my experience. Um, I think that painting was particularly inspired by the, the fires in California, actually. It was before the, the big forest fire last summer that took out you know, a quarter of the state in New Mexico. And like I said, I, I was kind of shocked at how prophetic it was because, because the, the vegetation and, and the location is very much New Mexico for me in that painting. And what I'll say about it in terms of um, kind of the construct of it is, it's actually almost like a triptych. If you look at its construction, uh, there's s some sort of quiet, subtle things happening on the left hand third of the painting, and then kind of the crisis activity in the middle. And then the smoke gave me a wonderful excuse for sort of moving paint in a different way. 
and so the the it should have probably been three panels, but I sort of smashed it all into one. Um, and that's, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Could you talk a little bit more about how you plan your artwork? Specifically, do you start with a allegorical idea and then pick the animals? Or do you pick the animals first and then match the allegory to their behavior? Good question, Rachel. <laughs> Um, I start with, with how I want to paint, mm, I think, mm. yeah, you know, it's interesting to me, I, I've shown you a variety of paint strokes that I've used, so some are very aggressive and, and stretched and, and large, and then others are extremely delicate and sometimes even very claustrophobic. And I think that how I apply paint sort of reflects where I am in my life, if I'm feeling very contracted or if I'm feeling very expansive. And so sometime I, I, will, I will just feel like I need a big expansive painting and then I go into my brain. I've never tried to articulate this. You have such intelligent questions go into my brain and, and, and I try to pick what's keeping it from exploding at the moment. <laughs> so it's like, you know, what has to come out? I mean, I think when we get back to, to storytelling and narration, I think we all create stories to, to help us through life. We all, we all create our own narrations as we go along. And so there are always some things in my head that, that I feel like if I don't get them out, I won't understand them completely. So it is kind of a marriage of the two. I can't really say I start one place, but I do notice that there's this, you know, interesting collaboration. And because I work so slowly, I, I really am a very slow painter and slow producer, things have a long time to brew in my head. So I can think about a painting for years ahead of, of when I do it. And so it has a long time to, to come into fruition. And all that time I'm like taking clues and, and building on it until I finally have time to do it. Yes? So if you take a long time and you know, in your mind and develop in your mind this painting, once you start, do you do it with a frenzy, or do you slowly do your heart? Slowly do my heart. <laughs> That's a good question. No, they do take a long time, and then um, my process is very slow. I start by drawing onto the canvas with a very light kind of ochre, and then I go through a phase of, of, of changing things, letting things evolve and come and go. And then once I'm pretty sure about where I'm going, that's when I come in with, with heavy paint. And so I think the painting, the forest fire, I did have interruptions, but I think it took me about two years. Other paintings will take, if, depending on the size, might take six months uh, to a year. Um, watercolors, gouaches, uh, sometimes I'll destroy the first 10 or 20 until I get it right. I mean, I like, I like the surface of a painting to look very, very fresh and very spontaneous. So I like to know where I'm going and then I, then whatever happens, happens and hopefully it's a success. But um, I give myself a lot of, Lead, a lot of lead time into the final decisions so that they so that they hopefully stay very fresh and spontaneous and it looks it looks quick I hope but <laughs> you know I once saw um, a rehearsal for the Alvin Ailey dance company they came to Albuquerque when I was a student and uh, our drawing teacher took us to uh, 
draw while they rehearsed, which was really fun. And Judith Jameson was the major dancer at the time, and she had a, a long skirt on with all these petticoats, and she would rush out onto the stage and do this big kick, and her skirts and her petticoats would fly up in the air. I saw her rehearse that move for probably 20 times, and then when I went to the performance that night, you know, she just rushed out on the stage and did it, and it was just beautiful, and I thought, oh, if I could only paint that way, you know. So I did realize that, that you know, behind every effortless move, there, there usually is a lot of practice and struggle. I yes. noticed that you use a wide range of palette. You go from very subtle to very bold. Mm -hmm. Think that you're on the also. Yeah, I think I really, I think, I think I really like bright color. <laughs> Sometimes I have to like hold myself at bay. Um, but yes, I like subtle things too. And I think sometime once I get involved in a painting, it's what the painting calls for. Do I need to kick up the color to get to elicit a more emotional response? Or do I need to keep it very subtle so that someone has to think a little bit more or look a little bit harder? Um, and I think we're, you know, we're complex people and, and sometimes you, you feel quieter and there are quiet moments and sometimes you feel very expansive and expressive. And so I think um, sometimes it's a conscious decision, but sometimes it just happens while I'm exploring what I'm painting. I noticed a lot of your strokes and some of your paintings looked very much like Van Gogh's background. Mm-hmm. And it was a great influence. Certainly. Yeah, I, uh, I did not get a master's. I graduated as an undergraduate and didn't really quite know what I wanted to paint. And I went to the bookstore, and they had a big Van Gogh book on sale. And I bought it, and I think he was a, you know, a very early teacher. And I've always loved his, the immediacy of his strokes. And of course, he would go out and just do one in the afternoon. But that's not, you know, I can't do that, but <laughs> I wish. But yes, I love the way that his brush strokes direct you around his paintings, like they, they will direct you over a field or they will direct you around a head. You know, he uses his brushstroke very deliberately to direct the eye, and I would say that was a big influence. I was wondering if you uh, paint mostly in the studio. You, you, I do. It seems like you do. Yeah. Do you go outside much, or, or would that be more for drawing and preparation? I am outside a lot. I love to walk, I love to hike, um, but I've tried to paint outside and bees like oil paint <laughs> and flies like oil paint and gnats and wasps like oil paint and, and wind likes to carry your canvas. And um, so yeah, I take things into the studio, but I do take a lot of photographs and I have files of images that I have cut from magazines. I mean, it's so different now. When I started working with animals in the 70s, um, you know, I would cut things out of magazines and make files of them. Now you just go on the internet and you can, you know, and, and, and I do need direction. I need to know, you know, how a shoulder connects to a body or, you know, the, the the slant of an animal, you know, positions sometimes are hard for me. And so I do keep a big file of things to work from. And I try actually to kind of stay off of internet images because everybody has them, right? So there'll be some iconic image of, I don't know, an elephant or something, and you see it crop up in a lot of different artists' paintings. So I try to to either go back into my files or work from my own photographs for things, yeah. Yes? What particular uh, experience 
guided you way back when you did a few things in regard to Biovan and Irma Hall. What was their particular experience that guided you to the drawings and whatever way back? Well, I grew up in Houston, and I was taken to um, you know, I'm a hog's home where they have all the azaleas and, and uh, she has all her antiques and we would, you know, we would go on that azalea trail in Houston and, and walk through her gardens. Um, if That's not a painting I showed, I'll explain to those of you here. Uh, it's a painting with a bunch of azaleas and, this, and there's this ghost of, of I'm a hog, who was the daughter of, of one of our governors, who was, became a big philanthropist in Houston, gave her home and helped the Houston Museum of Fine Arts quite a bit. Um, and I wanted to do a tribute to her as, as a strong, independent woman. And I also wanted to play with that kind of translucency, see if I could paint her as a ghost, <laughs> and see how, how I could manipulate paint to look sort of translucent like a ghost and so it was both a tribute to her and uh, you know speaks to my Houston upbringing and also an an excuse to experiment with paint in a certain way we'll yeah take one more uh, a number of your uh, parts on paper have collage elements yes Yes, that, that's relatively new, and, and the painting, um, the Borderlands painting, and, and one of these on the wall over here, I've probably been doing those about six years, and as I was explaining to my friend Wendy earlier, one of the things I like about it is that it keeps the composition open for so much longer. I can paint these little figurations and then move them around, and uh, you know, that's once, once I start in with heavy paint on a canvas or once you commit with watercolor, what you put down is pretty much there. You know, there's, I don't scrape out or anything. It's, 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 it's permanent. And, but with, with the collages, you know, I can keep moving them around for a long, long time and they do change quite a bit and it's a lot of fun. And I, working on this Japanese paper, I really love the, the, the texture of it and sort of the subtlety of it and the way that the paper absorbs the ink and, and the paint um, so that it's sort of a softness, sort of a dreaminess to it. Uh, so I, I will continue to, to work with those. I, I'm really having a good time with them. And also, you know, as, as, I, as I age, <laughs> um, fumes are, are are taking a bigger toll on my body. So, so, so solvents and things like that aren't as easy to work with for long periods of time. And those are gouache and watercolor. And so it's, it's easier to um, come and go to them. And also it's a little less toxic in my studio. Well, thank you, Melissa. Thank you, Caleb. <laughs> thank you all very much for coming. I really appreciate it.